Before Alexander start, I just want to give like a brief introduction. Alexander is um, one of the key developers of um, the very one of the probably one of the famous uh, um, Auto ML uh, packages uh, for time series forecasting, which is called Auto Glue on uh, Time Series. I had the honor to meet you in Berlin a couple months ago. We we chatted a lot about time series and all the different uh, yeah all the different potential here. And um, yeah, I'm very looking forward to, to your talk today, which will be about um, probabilistic time series forecasting in an, uh, yeah, in an auto machine learning manner. Uh, Alexander, the stage is yours. Uh, yeah, I'm Alexander, I'm an applied scientist at AWS, where I work on other one time series. <clears throat> and today I'm going to tell you more about this framework for other mouth of probabilistic time series forecast. Uh, so first, just to get started, what is other one? It's started as an open source machine learning library developed here at AWS, but now it's just an open source library where a lot of people contribute on GitHub as well. And our goal is to make machine learning as accessible to as many people as possible. So we make to democratize machine learning. And the general principle what we're trying to achieve is to um, provide a tool where you can get the most accurate machine learning model for different machine learning tasks, no matter what the data are. Images, text, time series, tabular data. With three lines of code, you should be able to get the best possible prediction for your data and for your use cases. And it's also completely open source, easy to install, so it like, has an open source license, so you can use it commercially or whichever you want, even on your laptop. All you have to do is just you can install AutoGlone and you will get it on your laptop and you can run and see how it works for yourself. Um, so a bit more context, it's also now very actively used around Amazon, including both some AI services provided at AWS and also in other parts more logistics oriented, such as supply chain optimization at Amazon as well. So it's quite heavily used internally, also externally by other companies like NVIDIA, NVIDIA Intel, IBM, Capcom, and Tibishi. And we also maintain post ties for the academic community. And for example, we have a keynote at the Arduino conference uh, in 22, and also another one in 23. Uh, so before we move on to time series, I want to provide some more context as to what Arduino is. And it all just started as an Arduino library for tabular data. And by that, I mean essentially any data set that you can represent as a CSV file or Excel table, where you have tasks such as regression or classification. And it started a couple of years back, and since then it went on to like, for, for, on quite a long path. And at this point, we can very confidently say that it is the state-of-the-art machine learning framework for AutoML and uh, for that one and regression data. And um, maybe not just like not, not, not just AutoML, but machine learning framework in general. So we have recently released the version 1.0, and here on the right you can see some benchmarking results that are out on the press and on the very very widely used. RML benchmark, which consists of 100 core data sets and 10 poles each in various classification and regression tasks. And so it's about more than 1,000 classification and regression tasks. And um, there you can see the results for AutoGone are quite by a large margin better than anything that any other RML or just machine learning system brings to the table. So we have an 80% plus win rate against every competing RML system. The difference in the performance is quite large, so there's a gap in the, in the loss as well. And the average rank is close to two, which is much better than what all the other frameworks achieve. So it's really, really accurate and also very easy to use, as you will see in a couple of slides. And it's not just accurate, it's also, um, it actually pre denominates all the other frameworks. So if you're looking for a fast system where we can get predictions very quickly, and so you maybe have some constraints on the prediction time, and then you can actually, by using some small, like, by specifying what your constraints are, you can you're able to get the predictors that are just pretty good better than anything else uh, out there in the other model among other automobile frameworks. Another interesting thing about Autobone is that it's um, not really it's quite different from most of the more, most of other famous automobile frameworks. Typically, these automobile systems focus on hyperparameter tuning for different models, and but Autobone takes a very different path. And it doesn't do any hyperparameter tuning, and it's all about just training a diverse set of models and then doing assembly in a smart way, uh, which leads to these remarkable results in performance. So this is the general context. This is what AutoGone was like for a couple of years now, working on tabular data. But now today, I want to tell you about the time series module AutoGone, which is more of a relatively recent edition, where we released it about a year ago. 
And the goal here is to bring uh, all these nice things that out of one offers to the world of time series forecasting. And because time series forecasting is quite a different problem set and it has a lot of unique challenges and opportunities, um, which is why we need to develop separate, uh, we introduce a separate module for it. But the general guiding principle for the design and our goals are the same as for the dental module. Um, the goal is to have something that is extremely easy to use, robust, and can handle whatever the user provides to us in terms of the data, and can give you the most accurate forecast, the either point forecast or probabilistic forecast. Um, I guess most people here, for most people here, I don't have to tell what time series forecasting is, but anyway, just a quick recap. Um, we have some measurement that changes over time, maybe number of visitors coming to a website, maybe energy consumption versus some household, maybe uh, demand for different products that you have in your inventory. We have these past historic measurements in our goals to predict what will happen in the future. And uh, typically in time series forecasting, we don't just care about a point forecast where we predict a single value for each future time step. Um, we also often want to have a probabilistic forecast where we also have some kind of uncertainty estimate as to what is the range of possible outcomes. And this is what's the most important part for decision making to actually reason about these probabilistic forecasts and not just simple predictions for the future. Um, so now we want to see like how you know how you can work with other one time series using your data. And typically, like at the very bare minimum, the time series data consists of some time series and can be multiple and independent, well, not necessarily independent, but multiple and separate univariate time series. For example, each time series might correspond to sales of a certain product, which you measure at different points in time. And you can combine all these time series with different products into one big Pandas data frame or Excel sheet or CSV file, um, where at the very minimum, what you, what, what you need are just three columns. The first one is the unique identifier for each item, maybe the name of the product. And the second one is the timestamp, which tells us when the measurement was made. And the third column is, of course, the measurement itself, so the time series value that we are trying to forecast. Um, quite often, we also have some additional information available to us, maybe some covariates. And sometimes these covariates can change over time. For example, you know, as a very simple example can be an indicator which tells us if a day is a weekend or not, maybe if we have a promotion or not, maybe some weather forecast or some price information. And we also have some other covariates that are not changing over time, but are kind of connected to each time series, maybe size of the product, its brand, the city where the product was sold, uh, maybe the price if it doesn't change. And um, so and once we have this information in these two tables, and this is essentially all we need to use other content series, and this is how we can formulate our forecasting problem. So, like I promised, it's just three lines of code, is all you need to get an accurate forecast. And what happens here is first we so after did the we install AutoGlone and install the AutoGlone library, all you have to do is import a time series predictor object where you can define the problem, the forecasting problem that you are trying to solve. And so here at the very at the very minimum, we just say we want to forecast 30 steps into the future. Uh, but you can also specify some other things, such as maybe, let's say, which evaluation metric you care about, specify which quantiles you want to predict, or provide some additional context about your problem that you're working with. And then you call fit, and you can provide the data set either as a path to a file or uh, a kind of data frame, or you also support some other formats for the input data. And this is, at this point, our goal fits uh, the predictor when an L cover what exactly happened there in a, few, in a few slides, but essentially the idea here is that like, it fits multiple models and does an assembly and select the best model that uh, would work best uh, to generate the forecast into the future. And then finally, at prediction time, you can again call, you can call predict or not predict, and again provide the same data as that you use for training, and then the predictions will now contain the forecast for the future time series values. So in this example, the forecast would be another data frame where we have item ID and timestamps, uh, but now the timestamps are actually going into the future, so they are starting from the end of the training data and going as many steps into the future as your forecast horizon is. And then the forecast contains both a point prediction uh, in the mean column and also the quantile forecast for the level which you can specify in the predict. And that's, that's essentially the whole story. This is all you need to generate the forecast or multiple forecasts from multiple time series. And, um, uh, but of, of course, it's just like a very like, basic API configuration. And in principle, there are like many levels of control, many knobs that you can turn. And if you are an advanced user, if you want to change something. Um, but the main idea of other is to follow this convention over configuration principle, which means 
And by default, everything will work very well, but you can, like, you have different levels of control and how to adjust the whole system. So one, like, very simple level of control is, for, is choosing among them a relevant reset. So one option would be maybe you want to have the most accurate forecast and model. You don't care how long it's going to train. Maybe it's going to take a day to collect like maybe several hours to train it. Then you can just set the presets to the best quality, and then other one will spend more time but get a more accurate forecast. If you, on the other hand, you just want to do good some prototyping, uh, you can choose a fast training preset where it will train some fast models and give you the predictions more quickly. And the other one you can train is setting the time limit, which is amount of time in seconds which you are willing to wait uh, for this predictor to fit. Um, and other goal would try to respect it and in general be like very close to the time that you provided as the limit. And there are also some more advanced configuration options. Like I said, you can define your problem in more detail. You can specify which models you want to fit. You can even provide custom models or some custom metrics uh, that you want to use for evaluation. For evaluation. You can configure individual models, pull some of them. Um, but it's all hidden under this very elegant API by default. So you don't have to worry about you know all these uh, like all the advanced things. Like as a good starting point, you can just try some of these presets, set it to time limit, and you should get a pretty good forecast. Um, so now the, of course, most interesting part is what happens under the hood when we call the predictor that's fit. And the general idea of Aragon is to have train lots and like take the best of what exists in the open source community, combine to train all these different models that are all working like, very well individually, and try to build an ensemble out of them to get the best possible results. Um, in front-time series forecasting, we generally have these like three main classes of forecasting models that are all quite different from each other. And there are the statistical forecasting models or kinematic models like TS or EMA. Deep learning models are like, usually slower to train, but have some other nice advantages. And also, there are these other models that convert time series forecasting into tabular regression problems. And these are all the different models that you can take from different libraries um, and combine them in other goal. Um, so statistical models like ARIMA ETS uh, typically capture some very simple patterns in the data, like seasonality, trends, um, and uh, like the main feature that they have is we have to create a separate model for each time series. Um, and even though these models are really simple, they actually often provide a very solid baseline and that is competitive with more powerful methods. Um, as the next class of methods are deep learning methods, and uh, these are much more flexible and can capture more complex patterns than just maybe trying to analogy on some simple plot regression. And they have another advantage of um, being able to handle different covariates that often come with the data. Um, yeah, and examples of these models are DPR, temporal fusion transformer, patch TST. This is usually with slower, slower to train, uh, but can give provide quite a nice performance boost uh, combined with statistical models. And for the final part, these tabular forecasting models, the idea is to convert standard time series forecasting task into our favorite regression problem. And then we can use tools like PyGPM, CatBoost <coughs> to work with uh, to perform time series forecasting. And we can do things like quantile regression, we can do uh, regular regression, and then do methods like conformal prediction to uh, get uh, probabilistic forecasts. But in general, all of this happens in this uh, tabular framework. And because we already have, uh, we are building on Audubon Tableau, we can use a lot of these models, like very strong implementations of them, and uh, essentially make it easy for people to use these models for time series forecasting using Audubon time series. And then once, fi finally, once we train all these different models, comes the most interesting part, in my opinion, which is the assembling. And uh, essentially, the idea of ensemble, so what we are starting with now is a very simple way of ensemble, but it's actually an extremely strong method, as I will show in a few slides. And the idea is essentially that uh, the prediction that we produce by the model is a weighted combination of the predictions of individual models. And the way we can do it, and so what we do, we just assign a weight to each model that we have uh, trained. This is a non negative weight, so it's greater than zero, and they all have to sum up to one. And there is a classic algorithm uh, for uh, doing this really uh, stepwise selection um, of these weights uh, from Karama et al. at ICML uh, 2004. And essentially, the, the idea is just to keep any models one by one and in a way that uh, maximizes the performance matches that you have on the validation set. So essentially, you train all the models, you generate the predictions for the validation set with all the models, and now you're answering the question what is the best way to combine the predictions of these models to maximize the score on this validation set? 
And by following this simple procedure, we end up with an assemble model that combines all the other ones uh, on, the, on the other models in the data set, and this is what other goals are prediction. So it's a quite a simple procedure, but in the end, it's quite powerful. And we recently published a paper evaluating how this whole system works, and on a medium-sized benchmark with 29 data sets, uh, we saw that other one works really well compared to most open source things that we were able to uh, come across. So it's like, um, it's working against, well against everything that we were able to find, but if there is something else out there that we haven't considered and we think would be a strong base then we'd be happy to, of course, try it out and see how we compare to them as well. And essentially, we compare to all these like state-of-the-art statistical models, or maybe there are combinations from libraries like Stats Forecast and Auto PyTorch, which is another deep loading based uh, automatic system for forecasting. And then we have these usual suspects, the popular uh, deep learning models for time series forecasting. And in all the cases, AutoGone achieves both a really good average rank across all these models. It results in a large improvement of the error, and it even works better than any of these models in 63% uh, of the data sets, which is quite a strong result. Um, you might say, well, it might take, probably takes forever to train out of loan. So, you know, it's, it sounds like a very slow and expensive procedure, but actually that's not the case. And like, so we just know to look at, to analyze the results here, like for most of the time, for most of the data sets that we consider, the training takes less than one hour on a very simple commodity machine with 16 CPU cores, 64 gigs of RAM, no GPU. So, you know, something like on AWS it costs 70 cents per hour. So that's like essentially for 70 cents, uh, you can train this predictor, which is, Quite cheap in my opinion, uh, but you can of course train it on your laptop or anywhere else. But essentially, it's not that compute hungry. It's quite a simple algorithm, and interestingly, it even works better than just these vanilla versions of statistical models on really large data sets, uh, which is something we were quite surprised about. But that's apparently how these models, uh, these simple statistical models, scale to large data sets. But other well manages to get rid of all those problems and get very good, very strong results in just in under one hour. Um, and another interesting thing that we discovered, we, we wanted to say, well, what, you know, why does it work so well? So what can we, like, what is the magic component? Do we have some models that are really good? Uh, is it something else that, that makes the system strong? So what we tried are some ablations where we removed some components. So, for example, we removed all the statistical models from other one, or we removed all the tabular models, or all the deep learning models. And surprisingly, removing each of these set of component models didn't really hurt the performance that much. And even if we remove, if you reduce the training time to some very aggressive time limit, like one hour or 10 minutes, <coughs> it will still work well. But what was the crucial component was actually the assembling step. So if we disable the assembly, this would be a huge hit to the performance. And, and essentially, if we disable the assembly, we just take the best model and works the best uh, among all the models that we trained using the validation score without combining predictions with all the other models. Essentially, what it means is that the assembly view, assembly view is this crucial component that allows out of one to work well, and it's intense series forecast and assembly is very strong and should probably be used by everyone. Um, so this was the interesting finding that we had so far. Um, and now, of course, you know, it's a, it's open source, it's continuously evolving, and we are still continuing to actively work on out of one time series. And just, you know, it's like a preview of some of the things that we are now looking into and what might come in the next versions are some of these directions. So the first one is just better assembling for time series data. Um, what I have shown you so far is just this simple way of combination assembling. It already works really well um, given what we have, but it's very different and like much simpler than what people use in, for example, for tabular data. So in other and tabular for regression classification, there is this there is this method called stacking, which is where most of the other one strength comes from. And this is something that is not really like that explore doesn't work that well for time series data because we often have a lot less validation data compared to tabular settings where we can just do cross validation on the whole data set. But essentially, there are these unique challenges that we need to face to make a better ensemble methods like stacking, maybe something else, work with time series forecast. This is something we are exploring right now. Um, the other set of questions, of course, about uncertainty estimation. And typically, when we work with these models, these are either quantile regression models or um, some parametric forecasting models that um, often might have a mismatch compared to what the data distribution looks like. And control methods pro allow us to get good and accurate forecasting uh, forecast results without making these distributional assumptions. And this is something we could also you know, write into this very simple API uh, and essentially take care and get good uncertainty estimates for free. 
And finally, we're also looking into pre-trained forecasting models. So we, have, we are all aware of this huge you know, revolution happening in traditional machine learning, especially NLP, where people just take off-the-shelf pre-trained models to perform their tasks. And within this is where our forecasting might be headed as well in the near future. So now we're looking into these questions like how can we you know, better train these models? How can we include them as part of our goal? And in general, explore in this direction. And you know, of course, like another thing that I haven't mentioned that there's also like still would be very interesting for me and very much on our radar would be maybe there are some other problems or challenges in time series forecasting that you yourself find interesting, and we'd love to hear about those. And so yeah, if there is anything that you know, if they say there are like, there's these big problems in the forecasting that we are encountering, we'd love to see some open source library address it. Maybe other one would be this library. So if you have you know, any ideas or anything you want to chat with, you know, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, email, just you know, message me right now on Zoom or, you know, open a ticket on GitHub. We are very looking forward to your feedback and general suggestions, like what, what are your challenges in forecasting and how Audible and Time Series would be able to address that. And in general, if you're curious about Audible, feel free to check out their website. We have lots of tutorials and some of them interactive that show you how Audible works and allow you to try it for yourself. And also, like I mentioned, it's open source, so you can check the code on GitHub if something doesn't work or if something works great, feel free to open an issue and tell us about it. Uh, yeah, and I'm really, really excited to hear about your questions and your uh, you know, suggestions uh, about thanks to your forecast and how I will one could address them. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, Alexander, for this great talk. I think uh, we have a lot of questions in the audience. Um, who wants to start? Does somebody have a question here? Yes, Alex. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So thanks, first of all, for a very concise talk and very, um, very well structured and um, well to understand. Um, I have a question so, um, regarding the how the assembling and the uncertainty quantification or the, um, the you know yeah, the probabilistic forecasting part. How does this match together? So do you need so every does every model that you assemble need to have its own things and do you assemble them or maybe you could just tell a little bit about how you know, how those two aspects work together for the theory in our theory. Uh, yes, essentially the way this works right now is every model that we have is a probabilistic forecasting model. So it produces the probabilistic forecast in this kind of format where you have a point forecast and like one time forecasts. And for the model that don't initially have it in the libraries that, uh, you know, let's say like instead of forecasts, some models don't have it, we implement our own way to get this uncertainty estimation, um, maybe using the formal prediction or something else. And then, uh, so each model just has the same for, uh, like a probabilistic forecast for the mean and the quantile levels. And then as you take the weighted combination of these forecasts, it still remains like a valid probabilistic uh, forecast. So essentially, if the quantiles are originally sorted for each of the individual models, then after you take this weighted combination with uh, weights the sum of two one, um, the, in the end, the quantiles are still sorted. So that's like that's a valid thing to do. Um, it's very simple, <laughs> it works, but probably there's something better to do. We are very interested in what would be the, you know, <laughs> Uh, the answer is like, what would be the better thing to do? Yeah, um, Flo from Kratos. Uh, also, thanks for your talk. I have a question uh, regarding the used features for each model. Um, does Autofluent train each model individually with their own set of features, or is it like one feature selection step and then uh, training everything? Um, so in principle, it's um, it, it's like it, it's mostly shared across all the models, but there are some small tweaks that might be happening per model. So then, let's say if some model does not support covariates, like you know, some statistical model, then it will not use covariates for that. Or like if some models, let's say a tree-based model, requires you to doesn't require normalization, but other models require normalization, um, then like it would be like a per model thing. Uh, but there's no like pipeline, it's just like a general shared pipeline, shared by all models. Uh, but there's no like per model, uh, but there's no like selection process in, in, the, in the feature engineering. Just uh, like 
if users can do it on their own, or we can we do something you know simple, like reasonable default on our own, and but it's mostly shared across models. Did you ever do a study in, in that direction? And um, because I think we found that some models benefit from a bit less features and some take like full the benefit from, from all the features that you can throw in. Um, actually, we, ha we haven't like, done specific exploration in that direction. If you have like something, you know, that something specific to look at, I would be very interested <laughs> to have a look, or you know, like some what goes a publication or in general if you want to chat about it. But unfortunately, we don't have like anything specific and um, like specific studies and we did it ourselves. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Pietro. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, more interesting on the part of possible auto feature engineering that auto one might support or not. Uh, do you have some words about it? Um, so th this is like this is one thing where at least for tabular data we haven't explored like the, the way it works right now is really like there is not much feature engineering going and like the most of the time is just spent essentially training all the models to these like default features and some models might work well without the extensive feature engineering. So it's kind of like the general principle is not to so I think for many other systems you have these different possible pipelines that you can explore. Uh, where let's say do you combine some feature, do you add some new feature derived from other features? And um, so these can all represent different pipelines. And then essentially the idea of the map of the um, auto framework is to evaluate different pipelines and determine which pipeline works best, which is essentially a form of hyperparameter optimization, but now it's hyperparameters for this feature pipeline. And um, in other one, it's mostly like have reasonable defaults and lots of different models, and then just do ensembling, uh, like spend all the time doing ensembling and training many diverse models. Um, so it's kind of like a different design philosophy that seems to work well. And um, if there are some like, you know, specific, um, so like one thing that we're always like, on the lookout for, if there are some you know, other systems that do this, and then like, it's, like you, you definitely try to benchmark against them and see like, okay, they're better than us on these data sets and these settings. We'd be very interested like, to see like, if, there are some, if there are some good ideas in that space, we are like, very happy to take them over and implement it in another one. Um, essentially, so you know, if there's some specific, I think with time series, it's maybe like more challenging um, compared to tabular data because there are really all these like possible ways in which the feature can affect your predictions. It's not just like the, the current value of the feature, but it may be some past values from multiple time steps that where there is some interplay. So I, here I see there's more potential for feature engineering being useful, um, but um, we haven't really like the, explored that direction very deeply. And you know, there are some pointers, or you know, if you, you know some other RML or just you know ML systems that explore this time uh, feature engineering for time series forecasting, I would be very curious to have a look at them. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Daria. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Do you have any requirements on the minimum lengths of time series to which you can do predictions? And if you do have, uh, where do they come from? Okay, uh, uh, so this is, like you said, is it, the, the way it works right now is essentially, um, I think all time, at least some time series, need to have length of two times the prediction length. Uh, because the point, in other one, we need to have some kind of internal validation set. And for time series forecasting to be like at least the last, you know, prediction length time step each time series. So <laughs> the, the short time series, we just, we just ignore them during training. In general, for cold start forecasting, this is something we want to address better in the future releases. So right now, I would say if you have some cold start data sets, uh, we don't support it very well. Uh, but it's like I think that's a very interesting challenge, and we are like, looking into addressing it. In general, like the requirements are like mostly want to have at least some validation data. So if you say I want to predict 100 steps into the future and only have 10 observations for all of my time series, that won't work because we cannot we don't have no basis of comparing which models will work well on 100 step forecasting. Uh, because like you know, one step forecast and hundred step forecast may going to be very different models and um, perform uh, well in this setting. Um, yeah, so, so so essentially, and like and the other set of constraints are of course the like some models might just have uh, bigger requirements, and in that case, like these models, like if all the time series are too short, these models might not work. Uh, so maybe you know, if you want to do some kind of seasonal difference in which the time series are very short, uh, like that model would be excluded. We would only work with the models that uh, do not have these constraints on the length of the time series. Okay. Great. Follow-up question, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, 
um, you said the model will not uh, produce anything. Uh, is that on a per like you, you have it as item ID per item, uh, or is it on a like global level? Sorry, this is a super I mean, question. But. I, mean, I think it's more. It's, it says more just if you have some model. So in general, the, the way we try to like implement the whole library is to make it as robust as possible to the failures. So let's say you know if you're in training, you give us time series that are like all very long. And we train the model that does some difference, in which requires longer time series. And then at test time, we give a short time series. Then what we will like, what we will essentially will happen, like for that model, where this would break, we would like per time series impute something like seasonal heat forecast. If the model just starts to fail at test time, and it's essentially the goal is like try kind of to give, give you a prediction no matter what. And if you you know try to be mean and give us data that is very different in terms of its properties at test time that compared to training time, uh, things might not work as well. So you want the general expectation is like the data that you train on is similar to the data that you want to forecast uh, in terms of like time series length, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it's really more about like, so I think for most models where it, there is a risk of something not working properly, it could be like a per time series, uh, like, you know, fallback model uh, kind of approach. Cool, thanks. Let's have one more question. I think it's a one. Okay. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for your talk once again. Um, one question regarding the robustness of autoglobal and the approach. So, what happens if, for example, the data is slightly different? So, if let's say my data, my training data changes slightly, and I want to retrain the whole code with my whole yeah, pipeline, uh, will I get the same results for my forecast or not? Um, I mean, so in general, for reproducibility, let's say if your data, like if you just give the same data, like you think the random speed, you should get the same results. If your data changes, then of course the results would also change. In principle, this online setting where let's say, you know, if your data keeps arriving and there might be something happened, there may be some like, distribution shifts or some spikes, some event happened, uh, then like we don't really support this use case yet. And this is like another interesting thing for us to also consider, you know, it's a common use case, we will look into this. Uh, so this like online learning where like new data arrives and we have to adjust the models it's not fully supported it's more like right now we're focusing more on this use case where like we have some data and you know we train the predictor we generate the forecast then for the time for the next forecast we just have to retrain the predictor on the most recently available data um, and then like the results might be different depending on if the data changed or not um, so in principle like the ensemble like the ensemble in model selection step mostly relies on um, like the most recent data. So it's like if there's something happened recently in the data, this will likely be affected in the model selection step. Um, but in principle, uh, but in general, it's not like this continuous online updating. Thank you. Yeah. So well, I have one non-data science question, perhaps it's okay. yeah. Alexander, you're still ready for one non-data science question? Uh, I, I'm ready for all the questions. So. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Uh, thank you for letting one more question. I'm super interested, Robert said it, it's always about machines on one side, but it's also about usage. And I would be super interested how many developers interned in Amazon, like ballpark numbers, use it, and how much they know I want to, I have this not invented here syndrome, uh, I build my own stuff. Like, how do you encounter this internally? Um. So I would say, I mean, in, in general, you know, uh, like I would say, so we are like, working just on an open source project, and it's really like so. Some people might be using it and like not, you know, telling us anything about it. Some people that are using it coming up, coming to us with questions. It's not really, you know, nobody is forcing anyone to let's say use it. It's what we are working on this in the open as an open source project. And if people happen to find useful within Amazon, they will just use it. And you know, this keeps happening. So you know, we keep getting questions. There are some teams approaching us. Uh, that are using it, but I don't really have, uh, you know, as I would say that like, in general for this, um, I think like, for people, you know, like, if something is easy to use and it solves their problem, people will just use it. Like, and essentially, like, there might be some barriers for using it. Let's say, you know, I want to deploy it. Uh, how do I make it like reliably deployable? How do I get some like, like, Docker images where this is pre-installed and it's, that it's easy to use? And we are working on kind of lowering these barriers, of making it as easy as possible for everyone to use it. And also the other part is outreach, essentially making people aware of what it, you know, that it exists, uh, showcasing some use cases that address people's problem. I, I wouldn't say we have this like big problem of you know people are unhappy to try new things. Like if it's 
and like the easier it is to use, <laughs> the more open people are to are to try it. And if it's just you know, like you said, there exists a pre-built Docker image and it's just three lines of code. So like the all all the work necessary for the user would just be to format their data into this data frame format, which is um, arguably not a very high barrier. And so essentially, I wouldn't say it's that big of a problem. We are trying to like address it by lowering all the barriers, but uh, yeah, I mean. Maybe there's some kind of inertia that we still prefer the familiar solutions, but I think over time, as people see that this just works better, uh, people end up switching. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a satisfying answer, but. <laughs> I think it was, yeah. So Thumbs up. All right, then, thank you again, Alexander, and then let's have another round of warm applause for you.